In 2004, Pennsylvania State University's Lady Lions basketball team was one of the most successful in the country. Many attributed this success to coach Reenie Portland, who had gained national acclaim for Penn State's repeated wins. Jen Harris makes it down the floor off the glass and good. Get your hands up, let's go, make a shot! Penn State a chance to take the lead. Harris knocks it down. One of the team's strongest players was Jennifer Harris. Harris open for three. Tremendous! A three-point bucket for Harris. Harris was a top scorer for Penn State and a successful pre-med student. But in 2005, Coach Portland dismissed her from the team. I told her that I thought it was because she thought I was gay. And she told me, you know my views on that, and I'm not changing, and I'm still going to be the coach of Penn State, and you'll still be going. While Rini Portland denied Jennifer's accusations of homophobia, other players from previous years also felt that they had been victims of discrimination at Penn State. Loose ball off to Machaco. She's got a three on two to Wicks. Wicks the freshman, and it's good. If I could relate Penn State women's basketball to any period of time, I would relate it to the McCarthy era. Portland's training rules, no drinking, no drugs, no lesbians were widely known on campus, but no Penn State official ever put a stop to her discrimination. I have somebody telling me that I'm going to lose everything because I'm gay. I was basically threatened and backed into a corner, and I felt I had no way out. Homophobia in sport is, is an issue that's pervaded the sports world for decades. It's particularly acute in the world of women's athletics. These are kids who have spent their whole life working towards this goal. I don't know how to describe that feeling of, of heartbrokenness that we hear from so many of these young kids. It never, ever occurred to them that their ability to play basketball would be judged by what they do in their private life. I would really like to tell the details of the story in this film about the events at Penn State, but I'm not going to be able to and my attorney has advised me to read this. Coach Portland and I had a disagreement at the end of my sophomore season. Coach Portland and I had different perspectives of what happened. Those issues were the subject of an internal investigation and a lawsuit, which now has been settled. Under the terms of the settlement, I cannot say any more about it. Jennifer has always kept her eye on the prize. Even at three years old, she wanted to be a world-class sports athlete. She actually ran her first track meet, and she was three. So she won three trophies that day, and he said, wow, this, she's something special. You could actually tell from the first time you saw her run that she was going to be a, a pretty amazing athlete. There was no one in Pennsylvania that could beat Jennifer Harris in hurdles. There was no one in Pennsylvania that could beat her in a long jump. About 14 years old, she decided to concentrate on basketball. 60 Second Sports, there's one girl from our area named to the All-State Basketball Team. Central Dolphins' Jen Harris is on the team for the second straight year. The Lady Rams Jr. Jen Harris may be the best district girl basketball player we've ever seen. She just does so many things out there. It's truly amazing what she can do. In her senior year, Jennifer was rated one of the top 20 high school women's basketball players in the country. She also received national honors for outstanding academic achievement. I would like to play in the WNBA. That would be really nice get a scholarship to college and then 
go and play in the WNBA. <laughs> Jennifer was actually started getting recruited out of fifth grade. Her first letter that she ever received was from Penn State University. And by ninth grade, she ever received between three and 500 letters. Penn State basketball coach Rini Portland checking in on Penn State recruit Jen Harris. Jen drives here. After a visit from coach Rini Portland, Jennifer decided to play basketball at Penn State. We believe that Jennifer had made the best decision possible. Coach Portland was very concerned about the welfare of the players that she got. Penn State, we bled blue and white. My wife graduated from Penn State. My oldest daughter graduated from Penn State. We've always been Penn State proud. Amy Portland, 23 winning seasons at Penn State. In her first 24 years, 20 NCAA appearances, five Big Ten championships. Rini Portland had been a starting member of the famed Immaculata University basketball team. In the early 1970s, the Mighty Max were the first women's college team to play to a sold out crowd at Madison Square Garden and to be nationally televised. After coaching winning teams at St. Joseph's University and the University of Colorado, Rini Portland was hired by Penn State's athletic director and football coach, Joe Paterno. Well, after having spent some time with Rini Portland, I knew that someday Penn State's women's basketball would be something special. She's an icon. Coach Portland is an icon. Rini Portland celebrated 25 years as Penn State's basketball coach in 2004. It was also Jennifer Harris's freshman year. Things seemed to be going well until like February of her freshman year. And then I received a call from Coach Portland and Coach Portland said that Jennifer was hanging around one of the other girls, another freshman that had started with her, and that um, she knew for a fact that this girl was gay and that she was forbidding any of her players to associate with this girl and that if they wanted to remain on the team at Penn State, they needed not to associate with her. And that at the end of the season, she was revoking that girl's scholarship and she would be gone. And then we turn around as a sophomore, that same type of treatment was now being handed down against Jennifer. She called me and another player in and asked if we were dating each other. I was stunned. I didn't really know what to say. I feared losing my starting spot. I feared further harassment. I feared playing time. I feared getting kicked out off the basketball team altogether. It had nothing to do with basketball and the progression that she was making there at Penn State. And to be called in and questioned about your personal life, to be questioned about that, you know, it was, there was no place for that, you know. And she went through something that we now find out that a lot of the girls that went to Penn State has gone through the same thing she did. So it looked like it was a pattern that had been established for long before Jennifer got there. In 1979, twins Chris and Corrine Goulas joined Penn State's team and quickly became star players. Here's Corrine Goulas, good move inside, an eight-point ball game. Scott, I don't know if our fans can always see how the twins are working, but they're incredible. It's like they have one mind. We had two very different games, and we complemented each other. We were truly a pair. We always knew where each other was on the court. Back out front. If she was having a little bad game or I was dragging a little bit, we knew how to motivate each other in a second because we played, played together, together so time. much. I played with the Goulas twins from junior high on through high school, so we were together for a long time. Cindy was an exceptional talent. 
She can run the floor. She can take a 15-foot jumper. She can do baseline shots. She can drive to the hoop. She was a complete package at a very young age. In 1980, Cindy Davies joined sophomores Chris and Corinne Goulas on the Penn State basketball team. Penn State, one of the best universities east of the Mississippi, had a very strong women's basketball program. And at the time, Pat Miser was the coach. It felt perfect. It felt like a fit. Corinne Goulas gives to Chris, and Penn State answers with a bucket. That first year set a stone that I was going, wow, this is going to be a great four years. Between my senior high school year when I signed and before I started, Pat Miser resigned. And that's when Rene Portland stepped in as the head coach at Penn State. Rene really knows the game. I think she is herself not only a part of history, but I think she's a student of the game. I was just tremendously honored. I mean, I was ecstatic when she asked me to be her grad assistant. So on uh, September of 1980, I began my career at Penn State. I felt like we all had hit it off right away and, you know, played pickup and everything seemed, okay, this is going to be okay. We're all going to survive that Pat had left and we have new blood as a leader and we'll see what happens. Boy, things happen. As a co-captain, I remember at the end of practices getting called into the office, being blamed for lots of things that I had no control over, being told that I belonged in a straight jacket and had mental issues and a lot of psychological abuse. It was so intimidating and so overwhelming that I truly just kept my mouth shut. Every day I went to practice, a little bit of the love and passion of the game was being taken away. And I had an immense amount of it. So it was going to take a lot for someone to take all of that away. But I would say successfully, Rene Portland took it all away in one year's time. Cindy Davies gets the rebound, puts it up on the glass, and she's done it. Cindy Davies puts it in. Her 25th. My first year at Penn State playing for Rainey was probably more than I could have ever imagined and asked for. She treated me like, like gold, really. There was times she referred to me as her diamond in the rough, and sometimes I felt as though I was even put on a pedestal where I wasn't quite sure I deserved to be there. I was never privy to that there, that there was any sort of a problem going on. Chris, a 56% free throw shooter, averaging just over five... It was end of my sophomore year. I get called into the office on a Sunday. She goes, I want you to know that if your name is involved with any homosexual activities, I will take away your scholarship, kick you off the team, and make transferring impossible. And I'm sitting there going, what did I just hear? It was almost one of those things where I was just so shocked that I almost didn't believe it. When Christine told me that Rini directly told her no homosexual activity will be accepted on the team, one of my first thoughts was, I can't be on the team then, because I was gay. I was with women. I knew my identity. I was very comfortable with who I was. It was a very quiet, internal power that said, I will not change for someone. So we had this meeting with our stepfather. He was appalled that this was going on. He was actually real willing to take her to court right then. I looked at him and said, oh, I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> and he's like, why not? And I said, because all I envisioned was sitting in a courtroom with Rene Portland across the room with the general public behind her and me on the stand being this puny little scrawny kid fighting against Rini and the general public as to why I should deserve to play, even though I'm a lesbian. The next day, we asked for a meeting with Rini Portland 
We wanted to walk in there and say, we're not trying out for the team. Have a good year. Goodbye. And kept it as simple and clean as possible. And that's exactly what we did. Mm -hmm. The second year started out kind of difficult. Chris and Corrine did not show up. They weren't there. During a team meeting, we were told that they were no longer members of the team. I'm not even sure we were given a reason why, but I know that we were told we were not supposed to associate with them. And that pretty much broke my heart. And I couldn't imagine that there was anything that they could ever have done that would have warranted not being part of the team. And I really couldn't see them backing out and saying, I don't want to be a part of this team when I knew that was their dream as well. Several months later, Liz told me I was going to get called in to Rini's office, and she explained it was about the relationship that I had with uh, the manager at the time on the team, Donna. My concern for Cindy was that she was going to get confronted about the situation, and my memory is that it was a feeling of I have to protect her. When I was brought into the meeting, Rini was already in there. She was discussing the relationship that I had with Donna, and she said, Donna is no longer part of this team. And she said, and you have to make a choice between Donna or basketball. She then said, I don't know if it is true or was true, but if I find out that it's true or was true, there's nothing that stops me from going to the university, to the media, and to your parents. I remember that I wished I was about 3,000 miles away at that time. It was a rape, emotional rape. This was my livelihood. I had goals, high goals, you know, the Olympics and beyond. I was just a kid with nowhere to go and didn't feel as though I had any support. So therefore, when I was cornered, I had no choice but to say uh, that I was leaving the team and it was for academic reasons. Remember who you are and what you represent. That slogan is part of the Lady Lion tradition, a tradition built over many years under the leadership of Lady Lion head coach, Rene Portland. And to be part of that crucial part of an individual's life is really important to us. And those of us that coach at this age group understand that responsibility. She will forever be regarded as a force in the world of women's basketball. A force with a vision to raise awareness and create opportunities for young women through basketball. Now celebrate who you are and what you're doing, and you better be fired up. As far as a coach is concerned, there's probably no better. Okay, we are. Amazing. Her ability to um, be the game coach and call the right play. She's incredible. Everything else that she represents for women's sports, for women in general, um, has been so amazingly positive. Right away, as soon as you go to Penn State, you realize what is expected of you. It's very much emphasized to be a good student athlete and also uh, to represent Lady Lion basketball. And so there's a lot of pride in that. So you want to follow those guidelines. But on the other hand, I realized that I was in a lot of trouble because uh, it was in that first team meeting, freshman year, and Rini explained to all of us that we weren't to talk to a lesbian. And if we were a lesbian, she specifically said, I will take your scholarship away and you will never play basketball again. I chose to try to live by the rules and to try to make it through. I had to worry about somebody finding a letter. I had to hide and make phone calls in phone booths. I had to lie about having a boyfriend back home. And that's the only way that I was gonna survive. What that did for me was to create a tremendous amount of fear. I would wish on no one to have to hide their life like that. 
You have to believe that you can win this game. They're not going to flinch. I do think that Rini believes she is a champion of women's rights. We have to learn how not to flinch. But that lesbianism has no point in the world. Forget women's basketball. You picked the right school for the right reasons. For all that is good, continue to be good. Because you are a lady. Lover. Very fortunate to have a certain type of player come to Penn State and a certain kind of coaches coach at Penn State. And we need a road win. I really believe with all my heart that she believes with all her heart that she is doing the right thing by um, dismissing anyone who lives that lifestyle. She's a very religious person, and her church says we don't deal with these people. For those of us that live this, understand it, it really was neat. Rini Portland's attitude toward lesbian activity on her team was well known by her players, but it didn't become public knowledge until she was quoted in a Chicago Sun-Times article in 1986. I will not have it in my program. I bring it up and the kids are so relieved and the parents are so relieved, but they would probably go without asking the question otherwise, which is really dumb. Neither the athletic department nor Penn State's administration took action in response to this open account of Portland's discrimination. If I had such accusations in my calculus class about discriminating against any group, I would certainly have had an investigation into my case. It again goes to what, what I believe is the insulation of athletics from the general norms of the university. They are simply out of reach of most of the mechanisms that correct problems. Big time college athletics is uh, an entity in and of itself. The power of the athletic department, and particularly the power of big time football and men's basketball coaches, and who they choose to include in that sort of protective bubble, often wield a lot more power than the people who are supposed to be in charge of those institutions. I remember thinking to myself, my gosh, this university has a lot of money. Then you go to a football game mm -hmm. and you find out why. Welcome to Happy Valley. It's a great day for college football. You're looking at the beautiful Beaver Stadium where today the Nittany Lions will kick off opening day 2001. You see thousands upon thousands of people not only going to the game, but alumni who are contributing big sums of money throughout the year. And that money filtered into other sports at Penn State. And once a sport starts to have their alumni support the team without the school's help, the school has lost the ability to actually have that coach abide by their rules. The power in the athletic department resides mostly in Joe Paterno. I think he would agree, and everyone would agree, that he is the kingmaker over there. But it'd be very hard to measure all of the things she has meant to this community. My guess is that he's holding some sway at the university over the fact that she's still there. Not just the fact that he hired her, but maybe that it was such a good hire because she's done very well for the university, if you look at the wins and the losses, um, she's a recognized name. There is that sense that you're kind of part of the tradition. This is the institution. Rennie Portland is Penn State women's basketball. And so she thrives in that in kind of defiant environment of this is how we do it at Penn State. We're gonna keep doing it this way at Penn State. You don't like it, go somewhere else. I do think athletics is one of the last bastions in higher education where homophobia, heterosexism, sexism, racism, all of those things are still okay. Hired by Joe Paterno on the same day in 1980 as Rini Portland, Sue Rankin was Penn State women's softball coach. I was living in almost two separate worlds because I was very out. Um, people knew it, my athletes knew it, my you know coaching staff knew it, everybody knew. But I wasn't as activist on campus as I was off campus. In 1987, Coach Rankin's two worlds came together. 
she and other activists began to lobby the university to add sexual orientation to the school's non-discrimination policy. But there was no real change on campus until 1991. In the spring of 1991, there was an article in the Philadelphia Inquirer about Rene Portland. And in the article, there were several ex-players who alluded to her no lesbian policy. And it sort of reopened that whole conversation, which had begun in, I think, 1985 or 6, when there was an article in the Chicago Sun-Times, but reopened it in a way that was much more volatile than it had been in the 80s. I think it was the first time when the mainstream sports press really sort of turned around and sort of saw homophobia as the problem and not lesbians in sport as the problem. The students at Penn State were protesting. They jammed the phones and fax lines at the athletic department. They had rings around the athletic department. So there was a lot of media attention that came as a result of that article. There was a lot of stuff going on. And later that spring, they did add sexual orientation to the, the university non-discrimination policy. At the same time, there was a lot of pressure on Penn State to have some kind of education program for the coaches around homophobia in sport. So the, uh, the, the Penn State administration uh, invited me to come and do that workshop, a mandatory workshop for the coaches. It was clear from the very beginning that it was going to be a challenging couple of hours because the tension in the room, you know, the, the expression, you could cut it with a knife, it was so absolutely true there. Rini came in near the end of the meeting with Coach Paterno um, and sat next to the Coach Paterno during the process of the meeting. Someone in the audience said, well, we have to be mindful of Coach Portland here and her victimization in that wherever she goes now, there are protests and people saying nasty things. I remember standing up and saying, you have no idea what it's like to be who we are and to have someone in our profession say something like she said and how hurtful that is for student athletes and for me as a coach. You have no idea what that is like. So until you've walked in my shoes and know what it feels like to walk in my shoes, please don't try and make Rini the victim and not us. I don't really believe there's any kind of institutional intention to follow up. There was no real sense of leadership from the athletic department. We can't claim that it had any effect on uh, on the climate there or on any potential changes in coaches' behaviors. I was very vocal about Rini's homophobia. For the next four years, my coaching evaluations went down. I went to affirmative action saying I felt that I was being unfairly treated because of my sexual orientation and my activism around those issues. Um, and for four years, I was told, you know, no, you're not. For me, that was hammering on the wall that I was going to be gone regardless. So I resigned in December. Penn State is not the only place where this happens. Penn State is sort of the poster child. This stuff happens all over the country, and it happens every day. Homophobia in sport impacts student athletes, it impacts coaches, it impacts programs, it impacts teams. It also impacts the non-gay student athlete. Very few out student athletes still on college campuses. Very few out Division I coaches on college campuses. Why? In 1972, Title IX was passed. This week marks the 35th anniversary of Title IX. Title IX bars sex discrimination in federally funded education programs, including college sports. Since 1972, Title IX has spurred a huge increase in participation in women's sports. At the same time, however, the percentage of female college coaches has gone down from 90% to 42.8%. Women's athletics has moved into a realm of big money and big time jobs. And as that's happened,
there have been more and more men, of course, that have vied for those jobs and been able to get those jobs. In fact, we have had uh, an athletic director, you know, sit with me and, and say, when I was a coach and when I was hired, I had the administrative staff saying to me, thank goodness you're a man because now we don't have to worry about the fact that you might be a lesbian. Straight women leave because they're tired of trying to prove that they're straight, that they're not a lesbian. It's exhausting. Women who are lesbians are exhausted trying to live a dual life. After I graduated from Penn State, I went into coaching for five years at the University of Pittsburgh. I can just say that the intensity of that fear of being exposed was still there. I would wear dresses during the games. I thought it was very important to uphold that feminine look. I hated that. That was not me. The problem of homophobia in women's sports has resulted in this, this crazy ultra-feminization of female athletes. Suddenly, with everyone entering sport, there had to be this image of basically what men thought women in sport should look like, act like, and do. The expectation that female student athletes wear makeup when they play, or that their hair be just so, that they not have butch haircuts. It was very subtle at first, but now everybody has a ponytail. I don't know if coaches stand up in front of their teams and say, okay, now everyone here is going to grow a ponytail, but there's sort of this ponytail gene that, you know, keeps repeating itself. If I start growing a ponytail, shoot me. I said this. Uh. One of the allegations in Jennifer's case was that her braids looked too masculine and couldn't she wear her hair in a more feminine way. All of those things play into sex stereotyping. And, you know, sex stereotyping or sex is a form of sex discrimination. There's never been a separation of sexuality and women's sport in our culture. If you have coaches that see that and know that's what marketing is and that's where PR comes from and that's where money comes from, you have coaches that say, they can't know I'm a lesbian because then I'm not going to get rehired. I'm not going to get uh, alumnus to sponsor things. I'm not going to get the financial support that we need for our program. Coaches also know that the lesbian stigma can deter potential players. In a practice known as negative recruiting, some coaches will insinuate that certain teams are rife with lesbian activity and urge potential recruits to avoid them. When we took our final visit to Penn State in terms of recruiting, Coach Portland asked Jan where she had narrowed her final two visits down to. She said Penn State and the University of Virginia. Then she said something that really kind of bothered me was that if you're interested in Virginia, you couldn't possibly be interested in Penn State because at Virginia, they date girls, and at Penn State, we date boys. We sort of like heard it, but really didn't hear it because it just came from nowhere. So on the way out, I said to Pearl, isn't that strange what she said? She said, yeah. Coach Rini Portland came to my home. Her whole pitch to us was, it's a lesbian-free program. So as parents, you can be secure and you can feel safe about that not being an issue. And really, it's almost saying, too, that if you go to Penn State, then it says to your parents that you're not gay. Let's take the word gay or lesbian and let's replace it with black. Let's replace it with Asian. Let's replace it with Jew. I will not recruit black people. I will not recruit Jewish people. I will not recruit Asian people. How quickly 
would that woman be fired? Despite her publicized discrimination, Rini Portland received many awards, including National Coach of the Year from the Women's Basketball Coaches Association in 1991 and again in 2004. Ms. Rini Portland being awarded <laughs> two years coach of the year, which means she was voted by her peers, is only an example of how the coaching staff as a whole is allowing the cycle to continue. And they're the ones who can actually stop the cycle. I don't know what the percentages are of the coaches who are gay. Is it 50%? Oh, I would say it probably hovers around that. You have to ask yourself, how could a coach who is a lesbian vote for another incredibly homophobic coach, knowing the pain they've caused players, the shaming that they've put players through. The criteria, obviously, it's wins and losses, and your potential of your team in, in reaching that, and your regular season play, your conference play, and uh, but basically, you know, it's, it's wins and wins and losses. Seventh straight Penn State win over Michigan State is in the books. Despite Portland's winning record, the Lady Lions have never won a national title. When you look at her win-loss record, it's good. But she does it out of fear. Fear limits you to your fullest potential. Get this job done for yourselves. The last five minutes, win it. One, two, three, win it! How many times has she been in the last three minutes of a game and they were ahead by 15, they've lost the lead in the last three minutes of the game, she can't get her team to do anything because the last three minutes are the most trusting three minutes of the game. And that's the ball game. A huge win for Louisiana Tech to come in here and beat the Lady Lions. And a heartbreaker for Penn State. She has to understand that this has nothing to do with how the ball bounces. In fact, we used to joke and say, does she really think she's going to win a national title without a lesbian on her team? really are educators and if we're educators we should be putting at the highest standards those coaches that are consistent with the missions of universities and the missions of an educator. The fact that Penn State allows this woman to still have a job at an institution of higher learning in our country in the 21st century is just astounding. But it really goes to Penn State, and it goes to the leadership of Penn State. And what does that represent? And is Penn State really happy with this kind of image out there in the world? They've supported this for so long, and I can't help but to feel and to think that maybe they might, you know, agree with her or agree with certain things that they're willing to kind of put their university's credibility on the line for her. Allegations of Coach Portland's discrimination persisted even after Penn State added sexual orientation to its non-discrimination policy in 1992. I do believe that Coach Portland was still discriminated against women who she perceived to be lesbian. Those who were assistant coaches or worked in her staff, team physicians, tr athletic trainers, because they shared their stories with me. Soon after resigning as softball coach in December 1996, Sue Rankin was hired by Penn State's Office of Educational Equity and also became coordinator of Penn State's newly established Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender Resource Center. My role was to encourage people who were experiencing homophobia to report it. But the catch-22 for a student athlete is, if I report it, it's university policy is that you need to talk with the person who is being accused. Once that would happen, that student athlete would probably never play again. If you want to play, if you want a chance to play in WNBA, then you need to be silent about who you are. Courtney Wicks takes the long pass and scores. Rini would ask me for information on other players. After I told her how I felt about things like that, she never came to me again. 
Coach Portland thought that Courtney Wicks would benefit by having an African-American mentor, but when she chose a lesbian, Portland pressured her to abandon the relationship. Courtney refused. So then that was kind of like, well, is Courtney gay? Is she gay? I think she knew I was not gay, but I think when she put that out there, it was kind of like a way to alienate me. I asked Winnie Portland why she felt the way she did about lesbians being on her team, and she said, in the locker room, I just don't, I don't want you guys to have to make a choice. She almost acted like lesbianism is a disease that you catch. If you have one in the locker room, it's going to spread. Also in for the Lady Lions, Courtney Wicks, number 35, a 5'9", freshman from Wayne, New Jersey. I would have flunked out there if I stayed or just self-destructed. I had to make that decision. Either I need to go somewhere and start all over, or I'm going to stay here and burn out. Wicks left Penn State in 1997 and transferred to Syracuse University, where she was offered a basketball scholarship. When I got to Syracuse, they needed my medical records to clear me. Penn State sent my medical records. They were incomplete. They had been altered. My parents and I, we wrote Penn State. We filed a complaint. I never got a phone call. My parents not a, got, never got a phone call. There was never an investigation conducted. About mid-semester, the head coach pulls me aside, and she's just like, look, Courtney, I'm not going to be able to renew your scholarship. In reaction to Penn State's negligence, Courtney and her family went to the National Collegiate Athletic Association, which governs collegiate sports. They asked the NCAA to intervene and remedy the situation, but there was no response. One would think that the NCAA would be exerting a fair amount of pressure at this point on Penn State to not allow uh, someone with this kind of attitude towards uh, a segment of our population from, uh, from coaching those student athletes. The NCAA as a governing body, we really don't deal specifically with issues that may happen on an individual campus. We'll provide the overarching policies, but each institution is responsible for setting their own policies and dealing with their own issues. In a situation where the, the student feels abused, we have consistently recommended that they go to the authority that's in charge. Now, if, that, if they can't get uh, uh, adequate counsel and adequate advice and, and action in that, then they have to perhaps go to a higher authority. The players know that if they complain, it just means the end of their career, not the resolution of the situation. All of the support systems that we typically think we have in place for young people completely fail them. Their parents don't know, or their parents are hostile. Even the support systems within schools fail them, the counseling center. And so what they're left with is trying to figure out how to cope with that situation on their own. And often, young people choose dysfunctional ways to cope, drinking, drugs, isolating themselves, even suicide in the most extreme cases. I felt like everything that I had been working towards since the fourth grade was just gone. Basically, I fell into depression. I stopped going to class. I couldn't even turn on a TV to watch basketball. I was just so sick. After I found out my parents wouldn't support me, I stopped going to classes. I didn't do anything. I didn't know how I was lost. I just felt as though everything that I had ever hoped for ended. I thought my life ended, really. It was a death. It was a grieving that is down in the pit of your stomach, an emptiness that you don't put words to. I didn't know what to do. My body didn't know what to do. My mind didn't know what to do. I was totally, totally lost. The most lost feeling I've ever had in my entire life. To this day, being 45, I can say that was severely the most lost I've ever felt. and what we represent. Let's go out and attack offensively.
I want to see strength. I want to see power. Portland's training rules and the harassment and dismissal of her teammate based on perceived sexual orientation deeply disturbed Jennifer Harris. At the end of her freshman year, she considered leaving the team. She had already established relationships with the people that were on the team, so she didn't feel comfortable with leaving. And so the decision was that she would stay and try it for one more year and see how things worked out. Initially, in the beginning of the season, things really seemed like they were picking up. Jennifer Harris, we call her the X Factor because she's a terrific shooter from beyond the arc as well, and she's very much come into her own. She's called her the X Factor because when she plays well, Penn State plays well. Despite her success on Penn State's team, Jennifer was demoted. I had a call come in from Jen, and she was told that morning that she wouldn't be starting anymore. No explanation, no nothing. She went from, you know, maybe 30 minutes a game down to nine minutes a game. So not only did she not start, but now the times that she was getting in the game was cut. And then we get to the Liberty game. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Comcast Center, where the Penn State Lady Lions are getting set to take on the Flames of Liberty in the first round of the... So the Liberty game went on pretty much like the, the last couple, you know, eight or ten games. She was in and out, in and out. Five seconds to go. Jen Harris back to Strom. Strom tries to get the shot off. Brown will take the three-pointer at the buzzer. It's no good, and some heartfelt feelings go out to Hazel Jones. We're certainly disappointed. It's not the season we anticipated, and certainly not the end of the season that we anticipated. And certainly We started back home, and we were maybe on the road a half hour or so, and Jen called. So we pull off to the side of the road. Now it's 1.35 in the morning. She said, Coach Portland said, three players were not going to be welcome back. She said, it might be me. I might be getting kicked off. So we're, we're waiting. We're still hadn't turned around to go back. Earl talks to her on the phone, and she said, oh my god, Jennifer got kicked off the team. Nobody could move, nobody said a word. And it was just kind of like someone died. And someone did die. Jennifer's spirit died that night. And I've never seen her smile or laugh since that day. She started speaking in a whisper. There was times where we didn't know whether she was going to kill herself or not. We were frightened, very frightened. Each time that I asked for meetings or each time that I asked to come there, or each time I asked to talk to Coach Portland, was that decisions were already made, and it was her decisions and hers alone, and there wasn't anyone else below her or above her that was changing the fact that Jennifer didn't have a scholarship next year. In 2005, Harris and her parents joined forces with the National Center for Lesbian Rights, a legal advocacy group. They filed a formal complaint against Penn State, which, along with protests from the student body, led the school to begin an internal investigation into Coach Portland's conduct. What Jennifer alleged in her complaint was that Coach Portland believed that she was a lesbian and as a result took certain actions and behaviors against her and ultimately dismissed her from the team. Jennifer thought about it, coming forth and saying the things that she said. She didn't know if that would close doors for her on a college level, if it closed doors for her already in the WNBA, if it closed doors for her in the workforce. She made up her mind that it was more important that this didn't happen to anybody else. I just thank God that she had the courage to stand up and say, enough is enough, and we can't do this anymore. You cannot treat people the way you treated me. I can't say enough about the courage and strength of soul of Jen Harris. There is not another athlete, and I just get goosebumps thinking about it, um, who had the courage, knowing the consequences, knowing what's going to happen, to go and be willing to to do that and follow through on it and not be intimidated by it and just say enough is enough. On December 21st, the National Center for Lesbian Rights filed suit against Penn State University, Weenie Portland, and athletic director, Tim Curley. What this was was a David versus Goliath situation. It was really two or three lawyers 
going up against all of the powerful resources that a big university can muster. Penn State's lawyers sought to have the case dismissed by arguing that the university's non-discrimination policy didn't constitute a legally binding contract. We need to make our message clear. This is a declaration of our humanity. We will not allow these things to happen anymore. Penn State failed in its word. We have policies on the book, and Penn State failed to enforce those policies. And Penn State failed on a contract that it made with students and its faculty members and, and, and honestly, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Penn State should be held accountable for the fact that it represented itself as a university that was inclusive, that celebrated diversity and celebrated LGBT students, when it obviously does not. In April of 2006, the six-month internal investigation was completed. When Penn State found that Portland was guilty of, I think the three words were hostile, intimidating, and offensive, wow, those are serious words. And then, you know, fined her $10,000 and said she had to go to diversity training. She probably gives $10,000 to people at Christmas. That was a slap on her wrist, and it was a slap in our face. Regardless of the findings of the internal investigation, Penn State did not offer to reinstate Jennifer, nor undo the harm done to her as a result of the discrimination. In 2006, Jennifer left Penn State and enrolled at James Madison University. We're still subjected to the same things that occurred in the 80s and the 90s. And I, and I hold them, them meaning Penn State University and the athletic department as responsible as Coach Portland. In February 2007, Jennifer Harris's suit was settled out of court. When the settlement was announced, my first reaction was a, a disappointment because I, I, I really had hoped that she was going to have to pay with her job, that she would be held completely accountable. So I had to kind of let go of that and try to look for, OK, well, what's, what is the good in this, in this settlement? Although the terms are confidential, I can tell you that, that the university agreed to take certain steps and make certain changes that if any student ever feels like they're discriminated against, that there are now avenues in place, people that they can talk to, steps that they can take to help put an end to that discrimination. The change happening as a result of the case is that it's saying this will not be tolerated anymore, that there are consequences now if, in fact, you decide that you wish to allow coaches who are outwardly homophobic to coach, that there will be people who will come in and hold you accountable to that. So I think across the country, that's, that's now something that's happened as a result of the case. The impact of Jennifer's case was also felt at the Women's Basketball Coaches Association and the National Collegiate Athletic Association. The WBCA ratified a code of ethics in which members pledge not to discriminate based on sexual orientation. The WBCA code of ethics has been approved by the membership. Um, they had to sign it with their, it's going out with the, uh, your, your membership renewal and to say that you will, will follow it in order to be a member of the WBCA. In 2006, the NCAA joined with the National Center for Lesbian Rights in sponsoring a think tank to look at ways to end negative recruiting in women's sports. That was a landmark event. Sue Rankin and I looked across the table at each other that day, and both of us said to each other, you know, did you ever think you would live long enough to see this day? You could have knocked me off my chair with a feather. Um, but it was, it was incredibly uplifting to know that they're finally going to address these issues that I never thought would happen in my lifetime. There's been a sense that really it hasn't been talked about at this level in the past. And so where we go from here, of course, is going to be even more significant, but at least the discussion has been started. This experience at Penn State really left scars on people, emotional scars. I hope that they'll be able to find some positives in it, that it's looking at it as one more step, you know, toward a time when the coach won't be on the sidelines uh, after a, a lawsuit, um, where the sanctions that the, in, the internal investigations of the school will result in more serious sanctions against a coach who discriminates. But clearly, that was not what was going to happen this time. 
Do I see a climate that's changed? I think there's still a climate of fear. And that fear may be generational, may be uh, as a result of the fact that there are consequences for those who stay behind even after the case is settled. So how do we move forward as an institution around these issues would be the next step. Even the smaller program that I graduated from, St. Peter's College, they represented what women's basketball is all about. It's about change. It's about progression. It's about opportunities. When I got my first degree from IUP and I had my diploma in my hand, my mother said to me, we need to make a photocopy of that and send that to Rainey. And I said, what good is that going to do? Why? Why? She said, because she said you would never make it in life, and we've just proved that differently. When this whole story with Jen Harris broke out, I began to have very intense dreams and oftentimes nightmares. So I decided to write a letter to let her know that I, in fact, was gay the four years that I was there. I let her know what I have been going through. And as I put the letter in the mailbox, uh, my nightmares ended. What about all the kids that stayed on her team and chose to not be who they are? Where are they today? How messed up is their life? They may have a good life, but are they really, truly happy in their inner soul? I'm very proud of what I accomplished going through the pain and frustration and suffering that I went through at Penn State. The idea that someone could try to take something away from me and I, at 19, said, no, I won't let it happen. I will hold on. That is who I am. That is worth something. The case was settled in March of 2007. Two months later, Weenie Portland resigned as head coach of the Penn State Lady Lions basketball team. Jennifer was considered one of the best 20 basketball players in the country. She had a pretty good shot at the WNBA. Does she have that now? I don't know.